Good evening, everyone. I'm Paul Pribbenow, the president here at Augsburg College, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening. It's wonderful to have such a large crowd here in our chapel for the spring 2014 Sabo Symposium entitled Building the Society We Want. How will we get there with our distinguished speakers and panel? We are so proud to be in partnership with the League of Women Voters of Minnesota in this special event and look forward to many future events in partnership with them as we share our common work and common mission of engaging each other in civil conversations about the issues that are at the heart of our life together in this democracy. Here at Augsburg, we um, take very seriously our mission statement, which says that we educate students to be informed citizens, thoughtful stewards, critical thinkers, and responsible leaders. I would think uh, all of us in this room believe that those are outcomes and ideals that we should all live up to. And we're very proud to have events like this that allow us to uh, bring our students into conversation with members of the wider community on these important, important questions. Before I introduce uh, a representative of the League to introduce our panel, I want to say a special word of thanks to Martin and Sylvia Sable, who are here in the front row. How wonderful to have them with us, as always. I look forward to our conversation, and now I'm happy to introduce Terry Khalil, who is the first Vice President of the League of Women Voters, who will introduce our panel. Thank you very much. Technical timeout for just a moment. Is that on now? Great. Thank you. Good evening. I would first of all like to say how excited I am to see so many students here. You guys rock. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for your interest. Thanks for your passion about things regarding democracy and making this community, this state, our country a better place to live. So even to you all up there, welcome. As Paul said, I'm Terry Khalil, and I'd also like to take a moment to thank Augsburg. I've never been here before because I live out in Detroit Lakes, a really rotten place on a lake. Um, this is beautiful. Uh, to the students, the staff, our hosts, thank you very, very much. So who's the League of Women Voters? Everybody know? Some hands, how about the students over here? Okay, 95 years ago, this is Women's History Month still. 95 years ago, women got the right to vote. That took about 150, 160 years of really hard work, pain, suffering by a lot of women. The League of Women Voters in Minnesota was founded 95 years ago, actually a few months ahead of federal legislation in the 19th Amendment. We work on three things all across Minnesota. Voter education, which includes voter registration, candidate forms, issue forms. We work on study about issues. And we work on advocacy at the state capitol in particular on a host of things that matter to all kinds of people, whether you're a student, or a grandmother, frankly. We're, our membership is open to everyone, including men, including students, and we welcome you to become a part of the League. We're a pretty cool group, and we have a lot of fun. This is the first in a series of six events, communication, conversations around the state. The second one will be up in Duluth with Minneapolis Mayor R.T. Ryback and Duluth Mayor Don Ness. That's coming up. Uh, April 24th, I'm being told, good. My job tonight is to introduce the two moderators seated directly behind me, and I'm really pleased to do that. First, Ms. Joan Higginbotham. Joan is a former state president of the League of Women Voters Minnesota, the Minneapolis League of Women Voters. She's been around for a really long time, working, <laughs> but not that long. <laughs> And she's done tremendous things. She is joined by Tom Berg, who is a former Minnesota state legislator, former US attorney in Minnesota, the author of Minnesota's Miracle, Learning from the Government That Worked. He is also a senior fellow here at Augsburg at the Martin Sabo Center for Citizenship and Learning. It is my great pleasure to introduce both of them who will introduce our speakers. And again, thank you to everyone here at Augsburg. Thank you, Terry. Well, I, after that remark about how long I've been around, I don't know. But I, I will say that as I look through the audience, I notice that there are some other folks here who've been around for a while, too. 
and it's been a very good thing for our state and our city that they have been around and that they're still with us. So I, I, as I look out in the audience, what I see is I see the past, the present, and the future all here tonight, which is a wonderful thing because we're all here for one reason, I think, at least one, and that is to have a discussion about what our democracy means and how we can keep it strong as we go through the 21st century. So I'm glad that you're here. I'm so thankful for the Sabo Center uh, and the fact that they share our desire to talk about these issues and that they welcomed us tonight. So thanks to Sylvia and Martin for that. It's, it's great to be here and great to see I know something that you've both dreamed about having come to life like this here at Augsburg. So thanks to them. And thanks to the college for just being great hosts and helping us out, getting everything lined up and helping us to attract some students and faculty members here tonight, as, long, as well as members of the League of Women Voters. Well, I have a great job moderating this along with Tom. And the first part of it is to introduce one of our speakers this evening. And um, we just... Uh, randomly decided who was going to introduce whom, and I get to introduce Dane Smith. And many of you know him by his byline, because he was a reporter for both the Pioneer and uh, Pioneer Press and the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. So he has been a longtime journalist, and I remember when we first talked, he talked about how he um, got out of the Navy and drove to Minneapolis, and he's a St. Thomas College grad, and um, state has been here then since the 1950s, I think it was, when you came here. And uh, he is, oh, what am I saying, my gosh. I guess we're all trying to make everybody older tonight for some reason. And so he, when he arrived, he, he um, has taken a very active part in journalism, but he retired as a journalist, as a day-to-day -day journalist, and he is one of the he was one of the first people to become involved with Growth and Justice, a uh, liberal think tank, I think we could say. Progressive think tank, possibly. Progressive. Practical progressives. Well, and I think we might very well get into that later this evening. Uh, and he, uh, he has been on their staff as their, as their president or CEO for some time now. So let us all join in welcoming Dane Smith. And Tom will introduce our other speaker this evening. Uh, thank you, Joan, and I'd add to the welcome. And I note there are a number of former state legislators here. And I note, uh, in addition to uh, former Congressman Sabo, I see former Congressman Dave Mingy, former Congressman Don Fraser. And I don't know if there's some others. If so, I apologize for not catching you. Uh, but thanks for coming. And... Uh, adding to uh, all of this, and we might even give you a chance to ask a question a little later on. But first, we're gonna, the first questions are gonna come from the students. So I want all of the students, particularly, to be thinking a little bit about some questions, but the rest of you will get you in the act, too, as, as time goes on here. So give that some, some thought, and uh, we're gonna, each of the speakers have 10 to 12 minutes to talk a bit. Joan and I will start a, question or two to get the conversation going. And uh, this is not a debate, it is a conversation. And we're gonna converse about a variety of things. Uh, I think about culture and economics and what kind of society we really want. And secondly, how in the world do we get there? It's a difficult task. So give that some thought as you listen to people. And uh, I have the privilege of introducing our uh, speaker, Mitch Perlstein who is a PhD that he received in educational administration uh, from the University of Minnesota. He is the, uh, the uh, president of the Center of the American Experiment, uh, according to their website, a nonpartisan tax-exempt public policy and educational institution which brings conservative and free market ideas to bear are the hardest problems facing Minnesota and the nation. Uh, Dr. Perlstein served two years in the U.S. Department of Education during the Reagan and the first Bush administration. And I dug a little deeper than what they had on the website here, and I found out that he is also married to Diane Darby McGowan, who is a Minneapolis police chaplain. That uh, I know they live in Minneapolis, and they have four children, uh, adult children, four grandchildren, 
and at the moment they only have two dogs. <laughs> uh, what it said. So uh, with that, uh, th that's the format for the evening. Uh, disagreements are just fine. Humor is really good to use. And uh, whatever, so we have this conversation like we're sitting around in the living room talking about some big ideas. And let's begin, Mitch, if you'll start out for us with your uh, time over at the podium. Thank you, sir. Tom, that was a very, very nice introduction, but you could have added that uh, you just didn't add it all. I'm Jewish and I run a conservative think tank. <laughs> That's not the punchline. <laughs> My wife is ordained Episcopal clergy who uh, used to run the shelter at our Savior's Lutheran Church in the Phillips neighborhood. This is when I pause and we sent all the kids to Catholic schools. <laughs> Dane will have ethnic humor of his own. This is a great country. Um, Joan, Tom, and Congressman, when I got here uh, 40 years ago this August, if you remember C. Peter McGraw, the president of the University of Minnesota, I came out with him from Binghamton University. And Time Magazine had just done a feature on 200 up and coming American leaders under the age of 45. And Peter was one, and Martin Sable was another. The amazing thing about that, at the time, Peter was 41. I was 26. Peter turns 81 next month, and I'm still 26. I don't know how this. Uh, right around that same time, I met uh, Augsburg President Oscar Anderson, who said something about how he shared the West Bank with this small little campus called the University of Minnesota. And I have remembered that for 40 years, so it's wonderful. Mr. President, to uh, be back at uh, Augsburg and where Dane is concerned, Dane and I go back more than 30 years to the Pioneer Press. He was a wonderful colleague, is a wonderful colleague. If this was supposed to be a more contentious evening, I would say he's a worthy adversary, but I've been told not to use such language. Uh, this evening, he has done a wonderful job with uh, growth and justice. As I understand it, and I spoke to Tom beforehand, so I think I'm more or less on target with what I want to talk about for about 10 minutes. A main uh, theme of the evening is looking forward. And my lens for doing so uh, currently is uh, through a new book that I have coming out in, uh, in August called Broken Bonds, What Family Fragmentation Means for America's Future. How did the book come to be? Uh, I'll be 66 in May, and as I approached 60, I said I hadn't written enough books. I was gonna write some books. So I said I was gonna write five between 60 and 70, and I am pleased to note that this is number four. So I have a couple of years to uh, relax. Number three, which came out three years ago this summer, was From Family Collapse to America's Decline, the Educational, Economic, and Social Costs of Family Fragmentation. And that argument was really quite straightforward, that uh, massive rates of family fragmentation in the United States, and such rates, the old term was family breakdown, the new term of art is family fragmentation, out of wedlock births, divorce, churning of all kinds, just about higher here than any place else in the industrial world. So massive rates of family fragmentation in the United States were leading lots of kids to do less well in school than they otherwise might, and less well in other ways as well, which was leading them, is leading them to be less competitive in an increasingly competitive job market where you have to bring some skills to the table in order to succeed. The same thing was happening to the nation. We were losing some competitiveness, all of which was leading and could only lead to deepening class divisions in a nation that has never viewed itself in such class-bound ways. I haven't found anybody to disagree with that way of 
framing the issue. That book implicitly ended by saying, I don't know what the country will come to look like given this breakdown, these deepening class divisions. Let me make it clear, family breakdown is not the only reason for deepening class divisions and questions of mobility and inequality, but it's a large one. I don't know what the country is going to come to look like, I just know it's not going to be pretty. The new book, what might the country come to look like? So three caveats, as always, before going on. I am not beating up on single mothers and single fathers. Uh, my wife was one for a long time. She gets nervous when I talk about these kinds of things. Single parents often do heroic things. Number two, many kids growing up under really tough circumstances are doing great. Many kids growing up under wonderful circumstances are doing lousy. Big country. And because it's a big country, on average, one has to acknowledge that kids growing up in chaotic situations at home or without a parent, on average, in the main, do less well compared to other kids. And as I noted, my wife was a single mother for a long time after her divorce. I used to say that Diane was my second and last marriage, my second and last wife. She didn't like that locution very much. So I now call it my second and ultimate marriage. The method of the book. Uh, at the heart is a detailed analysis of what 40 very distinguished, very bright men and women from across the country had to say in interviews from November November 12 to November November 13. Very pleased that Don and Arvon Frazier were two of my respondents, about 22 nationally, 18 here. By no means is this a scientific sample, and to the extent they're representative of any particular demographic, it's of unusually well-educated and thoughtful citizens who, frankly put, are better suited in practice than most in addressing the kinds of complex and conceptual societal familial, and policy matters that I uh, deal with. A fundamental assumption of the book is this. Current societal problems, which are cited by respondents, and which are at least partially caused by family fragmentation, are much more likely to get worse rather than better. This is the case because problems resulting from fragmentation tend to reinforce themselves or as one of my respondents, the wonderful cultural historian Barbara Defoe Whitehead put it, not only are there growing divisions as to who marries, leading to wildly diverging family lives for kids, but advantage replicates advantage and disadvantage is replicated generationally. That's why I'm worried, she said. At the core of the conceptual matter, given who respondents are and what they know, and they know a lot, Chances are much better than not than their evaluation of current circumstances are reasonably on target. Meaning, if they think Americans in the main, for example, don't have an adequate sense of the lives lived by poor people now, Americans in the main may well have even a less adequate sense down the road, given again that problems associated with family fragmentation tend to feed on themselves. Do I ask less roundabout questions about what the United States might come to look like? Of course, as in this direct one, and Don and Arvon will remember it, posed at the end of conversations. 40 respondents, 35 interviews, four were with married couples, another one was with two scholars out in California at Stanford. Question, and some, considering all we have been talking about, as well as at the risk of melodrama. What do you think the United States might come to look like in the days of your last breath? Got a lot of interesting answers at that point. But such questions notwithstanding, it's certainly fair to say that much of the book builds on extrapolation, as I just discussed. So in 68 words, what do the 40 think and say? And it's a diverse group in various ways. The respondents talked about slow declines, 
not fast ones. They saw a future America suffering the kinds of troubles we currently have, only more so. A place where have-nots have a harder time becoming haves. They imagine the United States is still the world's leader, but perhaps not. Still an economically successful nation, but a less innovative one. They assumed a less unified America with whiffs of unraveling. For our more immediate purposes this evening, I might put matters this way. Whatever one might think about the state of mobility or economic inequality in the United States, however one might gauge their harm or not, I assume very few people would relish participating in the current job market weighed down by poor academic and occupational skills. For present purposes, I trust that's all the agreement we need to adequately appreciate the nature and size of the problem we confront. The lastingly hard and angering grind facing millions of men and women as long as their marketable skills remain weak. But as decades of empirical research continue to show, weak skills and other shortcomings are precisely what very large numbers of young people growing up in fragmenting families are disproportionately entering the job market with if they enter it at all. Or if you will, beginning to close up here, another minute or two, in order to adequately recognize the giant problem before us, one, not need, one need not argue over arcane statistical question about exactly how much mobility has slowed if in fact it has done so in deep or dangerous ways. We need not fight over the extent to which we've become increasingly unequal economically or debate whether our nation's fundamental decency has been corrupted by super rich exploitation of amenable tax policies or hunker down in ideological bunkers or mix it up over anything likewise contentious. Rather, all one needs to do is recognize how rampant family fragmentation is leading to huge numbers of boys and girls growing up in single parent homes, learning less and being shortchanged in other ways when compared to fellow young citizens fortunate enough to grow up with both their biological parents under the same roof. So that we may all at least start off on the same page. I would like to think that whatever philosophical or methodological disagreements various scholars, columnists, other opinion leaders, or people in this beautiful room tonight might have regarding what's going on with quartiles and quintiles, just about everyone would agree this is one of the worst times in our country's history to support oneself, much less one's family, without strong and relevant job skills, skills increasingly born of a good education. Thank you very much. Well, uh, to, as, a, as a counterpoint to Mitch, uh, I am of 100% of Texas redneck Southern stock, and I lead a progressive think tank. So <laughs> let's, uh, that's, that's going to be refreshing. We, come, we, we, we defy stereotypes. New York Jew leading a conservative think tank, and, and uh, and you heard my background. It's really an honor to be invited here this evening. Uh, of course, I have enormous respect for Martin Olav Sabo. Everybody knows the backstory on Olav, right? Uh, I'm not even sure this is true, but we reporters used to tell it amongst ourselves, and it's too good to just not tell. But um, he's a Lutheran uh, Norwegian, you know, running in a heavily Scandinavian uh, district, and his name ends in a vowel. There could be some confusion about his uh, ethnic heritage. People might even think he's Italian, thus the Olaf. I don't know if that's entirely true, but I choose to believe it. <laughs> but seriously, few leaders in this state have contributed more to the quality of our governance and public institutions and our quality of life and progress towards this goal we're talking about here tonight, the society we want. Uh, Marty Sabo since the 1960s and when he was a House Speaker in the early 70s and with bipartisan support and the help of groups like the League of Women Voters really established and reinforced once and for all this state's reputation as a good government state. Um, 
and, and this idea of good government, of government as an indispensable tool in building the society we want, is a big part of what growth and justice is all about. Um, but that's really only half of it. Uh, we were founded on the idea of finding that constructive common ground and practical solutions that expand prosperity to get past this mutual contempt for the public sector or the private sector that ideologues use to their advantage. The word growth is a marker of profound respect for markets and businesses and the word justice is an embrace of the things that governments do to reduce inequality, to equalize opportunity, to create a better meritocracy. And we do this through investing in human capital and infrastructure. We often say the most important part of our label is the ampersand. Uh, our buttons uh, actually feature the ampersand. The and is the thing. And so I appreciate this tone of the setup here, uh, talking about building the society we want and how will we get there. And I like the way our policy differences with Mitch and the center are muted. I'm not actually comfortable being a bookend to Mitch. Um, I do want to say this though, uh, this so-called great divide and the polarity that prevents us from getting to the place is, is in my view, asymmetrical. There, is, there used to be a left, a smaller all the time, that condemned corporations and the private sector as inherently malicious and evil. You see this in Michael Moore sometimes. There was a left that was openly Marxist that tried to make a hero out of Ho Chi Minh and Fidel Castro and Mao. It was revolutionary and occasionally violent in the 60s. It was a primary cause of our polarization then and created distrust of our own good governments and distrust for that matter for anyone over 30. Um, and we don't have much in common at Growth and Justice with those voices. Mainstream progressives today are emphatically not revolutionaries. Seriously, the larger extremist threat today comes from, I think, the far right. Libertarians, various economic or religious fundamentalists who cling to Ayn Rand as if she were a deity or who insist that we are a Christian nation and should preserve our heritage as a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation at our core. Because I'm a Southern Texan, because I have a cousin's name Bubba, I know that this, uh, this way of thinking is alive and well in the electorate. Not well, uh, alive. You actually hear talk of um, libertarian fundamentalists are my biggest worry. Many emphatically reject the idea of altruism or a social contract uh, on which our Western civilization and, and democracy was founded. You actually hear talk of secession, nullification, nullification, uh, utter rejection or silence even on even the goal of racial equity, racial equality. Ayn Rand wrote a book, I read it, I went through my Ayn Rand phase in the 70s. It was called The Virtue of Selfishness. And she preached uh, literally egoism. Uh, and as wrong as the Marxists were about the ideal of perfect equality and communism being the only thing, this new faction is just as wrong about the idea of individualism and liberty and capitalism being the only thing. Um, this is almost anarchic stuff. Uh, I consider it dangerous and wrong-headed. And there are conservatives like our own Minnesotan, Norm Ornstein, and Bush speechwriter Michael Gerson. I really recommend Michael Gerson's work. They're warning quite loudly that these anti-government factions have badly damaged the conservative brand and harmed our nation. Uh, and I fear this faction actually may not want the same kind of society that we do, uh, that Mitch and I do. Uh, and I, and I, I'm really thankful that Mitch uh, does not go where these people go. Uh, I'm not sure what to do about this small and well-funded faction. Uh, and its impact, uh, its control over uh, one side of the aisle. Uh, but the question before us is how would we, the rest of us reasonable people, and I include Mitch uh, in this group, get there to that place that most of us see as the society we want, a family of Minnesotans and Americans who are more evenly healthy, evenly wealthy and wise, more evenly, 
Uh, and those are the words of Ben Franklin, healthy, wealthy, and wise. Anybody remember how we get there? Remember what precedes that? Nope. Early to bed, early to rise. <laughs> so you, there, there you go. Virtue, good habits, values, uh, and I agree wholeheartedly with Mitch on that. I think progressives too often leave values out of, the, out of their catechism, and it absolutely belongs there. Um, but here's the society we want, I think. Everybody has a decent job. Everybody who can work has a decent job. We really need to push for full employment. And that pays, an, and, and in jobs that pay enough so that kids can have music lessons and they can leave the state on vacation in these godforsaken winters in this wonderful place. Uh, the society we want at Growth and Justice has universal access to health care, uh, first rate transportation and transit system, less violence, improved public safety. First-rate parks, vibrant cultural and arts amenities, cleaner water, air, most important, early childhood education and cradle-to-career support as kids need it, uh, leading to better marks for them on a variety of performance measures and toward a much higher post-secondary completion rate. If we have a holy grail as a policy goal for Minnesota, it's a much higher post-secondary completion rate. Notice I didn't say college, any kind of credential or... Uh, or, or, or qualification for, for better work. Um, uh, this is basic stuff, uh, protein and vegetables, if you will, on the plate, and we think that getting there will lead to the more harmonious family felicity that Mitch seeks. More intact families, fewer divorces and abortions, spiritual growth, improved church attendance. Uh, you know, if you think about it, uh, all the great political slogans and societal aspirations over the course of American and human history, it really is about these meat and potato, about material blessings that benefit everybody, a rising floor. Remember, it's a, it was a chicken in every pot. Um, it was the ownership society. That was George, Bush, George W. Bush's. Kinder and gentler, that was his father. A new deal and a fair deal, of course, my hero, the Roosevelt's and Truman. Every man a king. Crazy redneck Huey Long, uh, southern Louisiana, born near my grandfather, but it was every man a king. Uh, and going back to the Old Testament, it was about a promised land flowing with milk and honey, uh, abundance for all, universal prosperity. So here more specifically is how I think we in Minnesota can get there. And I think it's happening already. I think the key groups that are seeking justice, public and nonprofit sector champions for the demographic groups that have been left behind and falling behind, this includes women, by the way, uh, and the responsible seekers of growth, on the other hand, uh, the community-minded business owners and investors and managers have to forge their own partnerships with each other. Harry Boyd's in the room to, together uh, here tonight, and I encourage you to take a look at the word Harry Boyd does at the University around citizen engagement. Uh, but they form their own partnerships and they need to get avoid, avoid, avoid getting caught in partisan or ideological traps and these false choices, all of this, none of that. This is really already happening. People are tired of the arguments. Everywhere I look, I see business leaders beginning to prioritize workforce equity, racial workforce equity, and racial gap closing. This will be the issue of our time. And from the other side, uh, Lee Sheehy, a very savvy leader of the McKnight Foundation, Lee recently penned a provocative appeal to nonprofits, urging them to be, quote, more market-oriented in everything they do. I th and I took this to mean that nonprofits and public sector efforts on housing and workforce training equity need to think like business does and anticipate private sector demands and realities, to think about the growth more and not just the justice. By the way, our policy and research director, Maureen Ramirez, was just named a Bush Fellow, and she's going off to get an MBA, an MBA, <laughs> to supplement her master's in public administration. Uh, to elaborate just a little bit more on this emerging togetherness of business leadership and equity champions, uh, in Sunday's Star, Star Tribune, uh, we had a commentary that I wrote that talks about redefining the word competitiveness. Uh, which is a treasured conservative value and a private sector, uh, a word that's normally associated with the private sector. And we opine in this piece that we got to be moving back toward a more holistic view of competitiveness, 
uh, and use it to describe the things we do with tax dollars and public policies to realize human potential, to equalize educational opportunity, to improve physical infrastructure and basic research, expand cultural and social amenities, this whole quality of life thing that turns out to be uh, a, a tremendous competitive advantage for these Twin Cities and for Minnesota. It's really encouraging to see the way business voices are coming around to this. Greater MSP, uh, which is a new conglomeration of big corporations and business groups, uh, also foundations and city leaders, is, commoted, is, is committed to promoting economic development for the metro region. Uh, you look at their stuff, it's all about this idea of competitiveness writ larger. Their website and materials emphasize our diversity, our rankings and attainment. There's almost nothing said about a particularly high ranking for this tax or that tax or about regulation. Um, and uh, one of the most important takes on this uh, in a group that I really commend to you is the Center for Fiscal Excellence. They used to be called the Minnesota Taxpayers Association, but now they're called the Center for Fiscal Excellence. This has been the reasonably conservative voice in Minnesota on fiscal policy. Uh, they uh, produced a report recently called Finding Our Balance, Taxes, Spending, and Competitiveness, and it borrowed from an analytical framework at Harvard uh, that made this very point about competitiveness being uh, the, all the public good investments that contribute to productivity improvements and set the context for an economy. Um, Haveman uh, applied this analysis to Minnesota using 10 different studies showing competitiveness, uh, one set that, that emphasized the foundational investment in competitiveness, and the other one, the classic uh, labor costs and taxes part of competitiveness. And Mark Haveman, uh, because he's a reasonably conservative voice, came down on the side of, we're okay on foundational competitiveness, we think we need to cut costs. But the hugely important point is that this reasonably conservative voice highly valued by mainstream business leaders, granted roughly equal weight to foundational competitiveness. So to summarize, I think we get there by constant engagement and specific goals, new partnerships between business interests and the champions for racial equity and reducing overall inequality and simply bypassing or ignoring the political parties or ideological interest groups. Not, not me and Mitch, of course. Um, but these players, the business builders and the justice seekers, are already producing practical solutions from early childhood investment to the Generation Next initiative led by R.T. Ryback to support for major new investment in transportation. We get there on focusing on these goals, uh, like eliminating the racial gaps through post-secondary completion and workforce quality and avoiding the ideological constructs that say it's all this and none of that. Thanks. We've, we've seen, we, it sounds like, uh, Mitch, it sounds like, like Dane here has the answers to, um, to your questions. <laughs> no, I didn't mean to. Which, which I'm sure you won't agree with, but that, that is, uh, that's part of our discussion no, tonight. Uh, technologically, it's not very good. I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, I, I brought a New York, one of my favorite New Yorkers here. Turn it up. Turn it on. Turn it on. Turn it on. New Yorker cartoons shows um, these huge armies massed on two opposing hills. They're like medieval armies and they're all battle gear and stuff and they're ready to do battle. And down in the valley are these two leaders, obvious leaders, face to face with each other with little truce flags and they're looking at each other with really open eyes and one of them says to the other, well, okay, we're all here, we might as well clash. <laughs> and so, uh, let's clash, Mitch, okay? No, I've been told not to. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it always. I always appreciate uh, Dane's remarks and his kind words. If I have a disagreement, well, here's a preface. In conversations like this, if you start talking about justice, and I'm all for justice, you forget to talk about freedom along the way. I've been a member of the Dean's Advisory Council at the Humphrey School for a long time now. And I said at the last meeting, I can't remember a single meeting where someone used the word freedom. One way of defining freedom is keep taxes reasonably low. People should keep the money, reasonably speaking, that they, uh, that they 
earned. So I want to throw on the table, and I'll come back to questions of freedom, not just uh, justice, and they are compatible. But if I have a disagreement with what Dane just said, was that he painted a picture that is a little too severe about what's going on out there, uh, not just with some folks on the right. Yeah, there are some folks on the right I wouldn't necessarily invite to dinner. Um, but I don't know too many, at least I don't work with too many, who don't recognize the importance of roads and education and so on and so forth. So at some level, it's a matter of proportion. It's not as if we're not spending a lot of money in the state. If anyone has a computer or one of those fancy machines now, if you went to it, I wouldn't be offended. Go to Minneapolis Public Schools. Go to FACTS. So it's about us than FACTS. You get the budget. Very nice. They have the budget right there. And you get these big numbers, and you have the number of students. Well, if you exclude all the money that they spend on capital construction and debt service and food and community activity, you still get this very large number over $500 million. And they talk about having 32,000 students. Well, divide one by the other, $15,000 plus a student. It's not as if we're being chintzy in this state. We're just not necessarily doing really good stuff with that money. The four-year four uh, graduation rate in Minneapolis public schools for African Americans, American Indians, and Latinos each is under 40%. So if Republicans are raising some issues about how we do education, that's a large reason. Well, uh, the Minneapolis school district uh, turns out to be a whipping boy for, um, for a lot of folks. And uh, I just think you need to, you absolutely have to look at the enormous costs that, it, that, are, that, are, that come from uh, special education, a really high rate of autism and special education uh, students uh, in, a, in, a, in, in an intensely impoverished community. Uh, I don't know what, a hundred different languages. Um, these, these strains are enormous. $15,000 per student is not a ridiculous amount, actually. It's what uh, wealthy people pay for their kids at Blake and Breck. They pay more than that. Um, and if you want to talk about the bottom line, Minnesota's total government, I urge you to go to Minnesota Management and Budget. There's a statistic that's been kept there for 20 some years called the price of government. And it's the true bottom line in Minnesota. It's total revenue, state and local, as a percent of our income. We're down around 16%. That's the lowest we've been in 30 years. Government is not uh, out of control in this state by any measure. That is the truest bottom line. Um, and in fact, uh, we have cut taxes uh, by quite a bit over the last 20 years uh, in several income tax cut rates, uh, uh, rate cuts, and, um, and uh, Minnesota is typically the public sector's role is to equalize the abundance that the private sector creates but uh, distributes so unevenly. Uh, that is uh, the classic role of the public sector in, in economics. and. Um, and given the circumstances, the incredible uh, maldistribution of wealth and income to the one, to the top one percent, we need more public investment. Um, and I think that uh, Minnesota's price of government was close to 18 percent two years ago, or 10, 15 years ago, in the middle of the 90s, when that crazy liberal governor Arne Carlson was uh, was ruling the state. He was a Republican. Uh, and, uh, and each percentage point of the price of government turns out to be about $2.5 billion. So we're spending about $5 billion less per year uh, uh, as a rate than we were under Arne Carlson. Well, I can come back, and I know this is, we need to get friendly during that. Uh, <laughs> if you go back 20 and 30 years, the amount of money we are spending on state government has gone up enormously in inflation adjusted dollars and taking account of population increase. So I, let's say for the sake of argument, I, I, I say now we're not overspending, but I would argue we're not necessarily underspending as well. And when you talk about Minneapolis public schools, I have the greatest respect. I don't recall ever writing a single nasty word about teachers ever in 
my life. But we can do some things better when it comes to policy. Uh, may as well bring it up now. Vouchers. The research is increasingly clear that kids, particularly low-income minority kids, generally speaking, will do better in a private school, meaning vouchers, particularly when it comes to graduation rates. So when you talk about ideologues on the right side of the aisle stopping good things, I'll concede that conservatives talk more in ideological terms, especially over the last number of years. But who's more dogmatic? A bunch of Republicans who are on the fringes? Or Education Minnesota, frankly, which is absolutely opposed to vouchers when they can help kids. So uh, we are uh, generally all in favor of parents raising children whenever possible, I gather. As long as both of them are, you know, decent people, yeah. Healthy marriages. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're in favor of good roads and uh, competitive um, folks who, uh, virtue, uh, it sounds like. We're for virtue. Yeah, uh, square. Also, we got that going so far. Uh, virtue, we're making progress roads, here. Uh, Chicken in every pot. <laughs> and uh, I can keep on going here, and I think we're starting to get into it now. How do we get there? How do we do those things? And what is the appropriate level of spending to ensure that uh, we do have a good educational system, and yet we keep freedom and liberty and uh, secure the blessing of the liberty to ourselves and our future generations that the Constitution talks about is an important item. But so is promoting the general welfare, both of which are in the Constitution, the preamble of the Constitution. So it seems to me we're, we're is that fair so far, what we're talking about? Well, I would throw in caveats such as, uh, with all due respect, I think you made a one-to-one -one connection between spending money and doing good things, a little too one-to-one. -one. You can spend a lot of money and do rotten things, you can spend less money and do Better things, and I'll come back to education. Again, when it comes to family breakdown, I fully recognize how extraordinarily difficult this is, how extraordinarily sensitive it is. I now have written three chapters on how to make things better, and I got to tell you, there isn't necessarily a whole lot in those chapters, but there's some decent nuggets. How do you fix marriage? But I can say, if you want, put it in, again, some ideological terms, uh, the left has been far more blasé about this than the right. The most important things that have been written saying, boys and girls, we got a problem here. Don't necessarily know how to fix it. But when, for example, more than 40% of all American children come into this life outside of marriage, when it's more than 30% for whites, 50% for Hispanics and over 70% for African Americans, we got a problem. What upwards of 50% of marriages end in divorce, we've got a problem. And I would say, and I, I work with some people on the left on this and they are magnificent, but for the most part, this has been an issue that has been led by people on the right. Well, I think there have been, uh, President Obama talks about values all the time. He uh, attended the prayer breakfast, uh, Jesse Jackson, other black leaders have often decried uh, uh, some of the worst aspects of uh, inner city culture. Um, uh, but again, speaking from my deep experience as a redneck uh, and understanding my dysfunction that I see in the rural South among whites, I think too often uh, when we're talking about family breakdown and uh, dysfunction, it, it always seems to be in the context of African Americans and people of color. And I think, I think, here's my suggestion, I think that the conservative leaders who begin to leapfrog uh, uh, progressives on the race issue and come up with uh, really substantive uh, uh, ideas, and actually, they're going to have to spend some money on this, actually. Um, and if they, if they get at the most effective, evidence-tested ways to turn that around, improve kids' uh, early childhood 
learning and, and get them um, on their way, uh, you know, they could be a majority party for a long time. I and, I, and, I, and I think that uh, Democrats, I, I would love it if a Democrat ran as a born-again Christian who uh, preached family values at every turn um, the way that uh, Dixie, uh, Democrats used to in the South. Democrats in the South used to be all for the populist FDR programs, mainly because only whites got it. Uh, or that was part of the reason. And then when uh, African Americans were cut in on the deal, the, the map started flipping. So, uh, you know, I think that uh, I think that, that that the two sides ought to do what they often do, and that is steal from each other, uh, recognize their weaknesses, uh, and 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 move the other way. I, if I could, very quick point. Okay, I, then we're going to go yeah, to some questions. I absolutely I applaud what President Obama frequently says about fathers. But if you listen closely, he never gets to the point of marriage. Got to talk about marriage. I understand the reasons why often folks on the left don't do that. But he'll say the most wonderful, eloquent, important things about fathers. Eternal responsibility. But he won't say the same things about marriage, even though he's in a magnificent one. Let's, uh, let's I think, John. Right. I think it's time. We could talk. We could ask questions all evening. But we did promise you that you would have your opportunity too. So um, we said, well, we since we're at Oxford College, we would love to have the first question come from a college student. So Is it on? Oh, there we go. All right. All right. Um, since you guys were last talking about marriage, I'll go with my question about that. Um, recently in Minnesota, the status of marriage has altered quite a bit. And I took I about 30 seconds. All right. <laughs> yeah. And I, uh, from what everything you've been talking about, you applaud stable marriages that stand the test of time. And I wonder if you have any feelings about extending that rights to more groups, um, if you're in favor of that idea, and if you feel like that's a good way moving forward. And I um, just wanted to see what you thought about Short extending answer. the rights. Short answer, it's a done deal. Okay. And I finish off the new book by saying whatever one might think about same-sex marriage, it is a good thing that that community has embraced it Race marriage the way it has, and the rest of the country should take note and follow. Uh, yeah, I, I I would agree with uh, Mitch. Uh, we think that you know growth and justice concerns itself with economic issues, and we we didn't get uh, all that involved. We did uh, urge people to vote no on the amendments that uh, led to the uh, uh, to the uh, extension of uh, the right to, to marry to all of our people, and uh, uh, I think I think we need to quit beating up on conservatives who uh, say what Mitch does and quit blaming them for opposing it for all these years, um, and just uh, move on. All right, we got some agreement. Let's move on to another topic <laughs> before we backtrack. There we go. Hi. Um, so my question is really addressed to you, Mr. Smith, and that's about the, uh, do you think there's a liberal bias in the media? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, Not, but, let me, well, I mean, <laughs> between, we're both media guys. I have right. more respect for journalists than most folks on the right because I'm part of that fraternity. I know newspapers are not put together conspiratorially with mimeograph machines. Having said that and fully recognizing talk radio is a, is a, a strong conservative bastion and there's Fox News and all. Do I believe that there are general assumptions in the American mainstream media that lean left as opposed to right, of course? Yeah, let me explain that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I waive spontaneous translation. In, in the journalistic community, you have a bunch of people who are actually, actually skeptical, who are beating up on government all the time. Um, 
you have Fox News. The majority of newspaper owners are conservatives because they're business people and their editorials are conservative, except for the big city better papers. Um, the, uh, the, the notion, uh, there's a great book written a few years back called What Liberal Media, uh, pointing all this out, that the ownership of the media is overwhelmingly conservative. Uh, the fact that the insane wretches who actually produce this stuff might have some common, some sympathy for the common man, you know, I'll plead guilty to. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the fact is, newspaper reporters are instinctively um, uh, anti, uh, we have the saying as you come into the craft, afflict the comfortable, comfort the afflicted. Uh, we're there to uh, basically challenge authority. And authority in this country is uh, in the hands of business and, and privileged elites. So uh, news, uh, journalists uh, have always been uh, uh, liberal, if you will. And, uh, and I think that's a good thing. I would point out on the, that, over the, that we got this reputation primarily uh, in, the, uh, in an era of momentous social change, women's rights movements, civil rights, anti-war, environmentalism, uh, and the media kind of took sides on all those issues. On which of them were we wrong? And I would come back and say, with all due respect, as much <laughs> I agree with what Dane just said, but in studies, when journalists are asked, what are your political views? What presidential candidate have you supported? The results are always overwhelmingly, particularly at the elite media, overwhelmingly to the left. And while I fully respect Real good journalists try to keep their politics out of it. I just don't think they can do so as uh, readily as uh, they would like. I think conservatives need to worry about the fact that the most informed people in America are so liberal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got another question over here on this side of the room. Yeah, I had a question. I'm going to bring it back around to education. I'm a student in the education department. And you bring up this idea of being competitive and teaching our children to be competitive future members of society. And I want to know your opinion on how forcing students to take standardized tests is going to make them creative, problem-solving, competitive members of our society. Should I? Uh, without standardized, I told you I can't do any of this electronic. <laughs> uh, one of the great joys in my life is knowing I never have to take another standardized test in my entire life. <laughs> One of the great joys is also knowing I never have to take any kind of test. And when it comes to term papers, I recognize I write them about every day, so they don't count. Can we wind up in a situation where we have too many of them? Sure. But one of the things we learned coming into the 80s was we simply had assumed that if we spent more money, kids would learn more. <clears throat> that wasn't working. Standardized tests are absolutely essential, if used properly, to find out what kids know and what they don't know. And when it comes to what they don't know, to help them learn it. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little ambivalent on this uh, testing controversy. And, and you know, I, I agree with Mitch. You've got to have standards. You've got to have some measurement. Um, standardization is actually uh, a a pretty, it's, a, it's a pretty egalitarian idea. The, the idea is that, that there's minimums and that everybody uh, achieves at a certain level. I do think that we got, we've gotten carried away with it, and I'm, now I'm worried that the, that, the, that the reaction to it is out of control and that we're going to get rid of all the tests um, that, that measure and, and, and that, that, that make some effort to uh, keep track of how we're doing. Uh, I think the thing we need to do with testing is, is do it, but use it in a way that, re, uh, that in real time, um, that where the results are immediately known and they're used to improve the students, um, to deliver to the student what that student needs. This idea of testing to uh, consign schools to failure, and that was part of the problem with NCLB. I liked NCLB because it put a federal role in the national education in the way it had never been there before. Teddy Kennedy supported it. No yeah, No Child Left Behind, I'm sorry. Uh, we fall into acronyms. Um, but I, I do think that, um, that we got crazy with testing for the purpose of, of closing schools, when in fact, if we, had, if we use testing to immediately respond to a student's needs 
have, uh, get the results right away, get back to that student with what the test shows they need, uh, we, we could even do more tests. We haven't been able to do that with conventional testing, it just takes too long, but with online learning, which is increasing its reach, and that's a very good thing, you could have the results back in 10 minutes, which will be very educationally helpful. A final point, if you go back, when it comes to higher education to the early part of the 20th century, standardized testing, the SAT and all, came about not to keep people out, but to allow poor people and minorities in because exactly. the fancy schools were uh, letting in all the fancy people. And the, uh, the, the testing was very much part of an egalitarian. And a meritocracy. The meritocracy, idea. absolutely. Uh, and, and, but you know that uh, there, the, the, the amount, the sheer amount of testing has to be, a, is a problem. Maybe. Marty Sabo sent me an email today, a link to an article in the Post by a, by a kindergarten teacher who was so fed up with data and testing that this person's decided they're going to quit. I'm no longer a student. <laughs> um, nice hat. Professor Boyd. Uh, thank you. So the school issue raises central question, which has been largely missing, although little intimations. Um, from a populist point of view, the problem is not the achievement gap, but the empowerment gap. Say that again. The problem is not the achievement gap, but the empowerment gap. Empowerment. The parents, teachers, and communities feel that education is done to them. It's not something they do. So, in the populist vein, I would like to ask, just invoke what you think of the American and Minnesota populist tradition, both Mitch and Bain. Well, let me demur on your point. Uh, if achievement gaps are reflective of the very sad fact that lots of kids are not reading real well, they're not computing real well, once they get out, side of school, I question how much power they're going it's to have. Another, there's another take on that, Mitch, which well, is well, that's my take. that education is done to poor kids. It's not something they or their families have any role in doing. I think that's an overstatement. I think that is a terrible overstatement. It's scripted. It's external. It's centralized. Well, so what, what I'm, I'm arguing, but I, well, I, want to, okay, I want you to respond to the question about the populist movement. How do you feel? I mean, I know you've written about this. Do you dispute the populist tradition, which is skeptical of centralized power, either economic or meritocratic intellectual elites? Or do you think there's something that we need to learn? That, just another note. So our center has been doing with colleagues and in other institutions, our Center for Democracy and Citizenship, hundreds of interviews with Minnesotans about the most pressing questions they feel about education and work. And what really comes out is that people feel powerless. They feel they don't have a voice. Ordinary citizens feel that they are marginalized in the decision-making process. So that's the populist question. I applaud, uh, this is Professor Harry Boyd, we go back decades, though at this stage of my life I go back decades with just about everybody. <laughs> um, great friend, he has done wonderful work in this area. Uh, we were talking about a bit of this before, I had to write something a number of years ago and explain Minnesota education history from 1985 to 2000. I had to say something about politics in Minnesota. I said the only way to understand Minnesota politics, or the best way of understanding Minnesota politics, is that we are a deeply, at least we have been, populist state in the sense that there is skepticism of things big. So you go back 12 or 15 years, actually 15 and more perhaps now, and in office at the same time, we had uh, Rod Grams, Paul Wellstone, and Jesse Ventura. Each one was as far away from the other as mathematically you could get. But the connecting tissue was that they were all populous in some fashion. Rod Grams, skeptical of big government, Paul Wellstone, skeptical of big business, and Jesse being Jesse. Uh, so is there? An important tradition there, obviously. Why have I lived in Minnesota for 40 years? Because I think this is a pretty good state. And to the extent populism has something to do with, put me down. <laughs> ah. Over. 
over here. Stage left. Oh. Um, I think that I think it's nice to think about the future that we want, um, and it's a little idyllic. I think I think about the future that I want for myself, and that doesn't involve me deciding the future that I want for you or the future that I want for anyone else. And I think it, go, it goes back to the core personal liberty. And that's what our country was founded on. And that's why, in my opinion, and I think the opinions of lots of historical scholars, that's what's made our country so great as compared to other nations. Um, it's people acting in their own self-interest together to trade that has driven our economy. It's not been us deciding what it is that we want to do to other people. It's us deciding what's best for ourselves and taking action to do that. And I think that the assertion that, uh, <laughs> that we heard here, that uh, people who love personal liberty are somehow a threat to a future that we, the community, or the communal want, I think that that's unfair. And to say that, as an example, nullification is this kind of far-flung idea, well, I guess Thomas Jefferson had a lot of far-flung ideas because he said that nullification is the rightful remedy. And James Madison wrote about nullification, about it being a natural right, because it's about understanding the Constitution. And there were only <laughs> enumerated powers that were given to the federal government that were delegated by the states and the people of the states. And um, I don't know, it seems like a lot of people don't understand that. And, and I, I would be curious to know what your thoughts are uh, about this. I mean, is the Constitution important? Is personal liberty important? The thousands and millions of people who died going back a thousand years, all the way past the Magna Carta, for personal liberty. Is what they died for and fought for irrelevant now? Are we living in a new world? Because I don't think that we are. And I think that the answers to a lot of these questions are solved by focusing on what I want for my future. And all of us focusing on what we individually want for ourselves in our future and not re asking and relying on a government to provide it for us. Okay. I think that's a Dane question. Yeah, that really clearly is directed at me. I'd be happy to take it up. Um, the, uh, the elevation of I over we, um, uh, when it really needs to be equal to we, is uh, I stand by what I said before. I think it's a huge problem. Uh, I've, I and many, many other constitutional scholars look at the founding, founding of this country and see uh, an equal theme on equality. The very first principle uh, voiced in the Declaration of Independence is that all people are created equal. Uh, what emerged from our Constitution is a powerful federal government with the unquestioned authority to tax, and Hamilton and Adams and, and uh, Washington fought hard for that. We had a, 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 a country that was disunified, uh, that was in total disarray, couldn't even tax to uh, provide its own defense. And we came up with a constitution that enumerates duties, all of which require tax money. Uh, this includes providing for the general welfare, uh, regulating commerce, uh, uh, the, the, the notion that, that our constitution and our founders were interested only in personal liberty and that all these people died all these years and humans struggled just for personal liberty is just false. Uh, the, uh, the, the national uh, motto is e pluribus unum, it's on our money. Uh, and by the way, it's not just your money. It's printed by the United States government, it has no value without the United States government's um, protections uh, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the backing of that currency. So uh, we are very much a we uh, as much as we are an I. And all I was trying to say is that that is that the, that the elevation of I over we is a big mistake. Let me just amend it this way, and I subscribe to much of what Dane has said. 
I resonate to the question and I resonate to the answer. It's not an absolute contradiction. But when we talk about helping folks, and that's what we're talking about, why do we in conversations like this, particularly in a religiously animated college, talk so exclusively about government? I'm not letting government off of any hook. When uh, George W. Bush was beaten up by left and right when he talked about compassionate conservatism, that was absolutely wrong. What he was talking about was something rigorous and demanding. Compassion as in suffering with. My wife, as a social worker at a church-related homeless shelter, could do more in many instances for the people she worked with than if she worked for Hennepin County. She could put her hand on someone's hand and say, God loves you. Can't do that really well in Hennepin County. So one doesn't have to let government off of some hook to realize we can do a whole lot more, should do a whole lot more. I support tax changes that make contributions to charitable institutions more likely. When there were cutbacks in the state during problems several years ago, Peter Bell and I, I think some of you know, Peter, Peter was one of the founders of American Experiment with me, was head of the Met Council. He wrote a piece saying, conservatives now have an obligation to give more to charitable institutions. We were making great progress in the early part of the 20th century when churches led the way and other institutions led the way. Government had to get involved, but we have forgotten what we can get out of our mediating institutions, civil society, of which churches and religious organizations are prime examples. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point there, Mitch. I, I would just point out that the, that the mainstream faiths in this state, Catholic, Lutheran, ELCA in particular, uh, mainstream Protestant denominations are all part of what would be called uh, the Progressive Coalition. They belong to the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition. And... Uh, and the new pope appears to have a little different view of He's economic justice. He's going to pull justice. out the pope on me. Oh my God. <laughs> I have it, never seen the pope at a DFL <laughs> convention. I'm sorry. And, and I would add uh, that the, uh, that, uh, the uh, largest uh, uh, portion of the Jewish community is also very progressive. I know um, Mitch is... Having done a dissertation <laughs> about Jews, you can find anything you want in 5,000 years of history. I'm just I'm just looking at the bottom line numbers here. Okay, very so, good. But but so so this idea that it's all about government is just not true. Uh, the the faiths are involved in charity uh, work and uh, as I described it, a new way of, of charity that is involved on in, in human development and pathways to prosperities. You just heard in my opening remarks uh, strong respect for the private sector. How progressives need to uh, appreciate uh, the the discipline and uh, the way of uh, uh, the efficiencies that the private sector uh, provides. And uh, so I, I, just don't, I just don't think it's fair to suggest that, um, that we say it's all about government and, we, and, and that our answer to everything is a government program. One of the things that Mitch's group and I and our group work together on is this redesign initiative. There was a Channel 2 uh, series on this. It was really excellent. And I think Tom Gillespie's here and some other folks may, uh, may have been participating in that. And, that and, and this is a third way, rather than taxing or spending or cutting, uh, redesigning our institutions, uh, being creative. Uh, Ted Coldry is here. He's been a leader in this for 40 years. He's in the back of the room. He's talking about the ways teachers can take control of their own schools. Um, there's a whole lot of uh, good energy that can be spent uh, uh, outside of these, uh, all this or all that debate. One thing, uh, Mitch, or uh, Dane, you talked about uh, was in No Child Left Behind was about the role of government a little bit. And I want to drill down on that just a bit because we've talked about the, the not-for-profit group, the, the uh, private sector, government, uh, the role of, of churches and other institutions. Talk a little bit about which unit of government should do things, and is that important? Does it make any difference? There's a bunch of former state legislators in the audience here. There's a bunch of former members of Congress at the federal government here. Yeah. I don't know, there may be some city council members, some county commissioners, maybe a township officer or two. 
does it really make any difference? The Constitution <laughs> makes a big deal between, we heard a little bit about nullification, the role of the states mm -hmm. and the federal government, who should do what. And I saw, frankly, Congressman Sabo over here twitching quite a bit when you talked about <laughs> the federal government getting involved in schools and education. <laughs> and so let's uh, have yeah. a little, a little he's, he's on my board. I hope I'm in not in too much trouble. Um, the, uh, I'm a big fan of all government uh, at every level and, and all taxes. So, um, <laughs> I rest my it's, case. <laughs> it's all good uh, all the time. Um, there, there is this, there is this uh, bias for local government. Everybody thinks the local government works best, the government closest to people, blah, blah, blah. I like the big, bad federal government. I like the things it does. I like the things that, that I've seen it do for my life, everything from the GI Bill to uh, VA loans that, that got me started, um, education aid. I think the big, bad federal government's uh, powerful hand uh, has been just uh, terrific for this country. Uh, and I love to run against the uh, grain on the federal government. <clears throat> um, uh, they have the best parks. Um, they have uh, they run a, a remarkably efficient uh, social security system. Uh, their administrative costs are less than the private sector and many of the things they do. Uh, I just can't say enough in behalf of my federal government and yours. <laughs> um, state, uh, state government, <laughs> uh, I, I would like to actually start a, a think tank that is just an anti-defamation league for government. Um, this, uh, our state government, uh, our state government in Minnesota is remarkable. Um, it, it's always come, comes high on the list when it comes to management and fiscal uh, uh, prudence and the way, the way we do things. Uh, it's been a pioneer uh, on a lot of uh, innovation and, and new things, everything from the, from the Metro Council to sunshine laws that Marty Sable got in into the 70s, transparency. Uh, we really, the reason we have such great civic engagement, 70% um, uh, voter participation and a high level of civic engagement is people trust our government. I once had a very conservative Republican confide to me when I was a reporter that, that conservatives had such a hard time winning in Minnesota because the government worked so well. Um, <laughs> so uh, I could go on. Yes, he could. <laughs> I, I, I would, look, I used to work in state government. Uh, I was Al Quee's speechwriter, one of the great people on the planet Earth. I'm his biographer. Uh, state government in this place does work best, but I think my friend was getting a little too romantic. <laughs> uh, over the past 40 years, the Wages and salaries of average workers has been at best stagnant, and for the lower part of the working force, it's been in decline. And this is especially true for men. Has this had any impact upon the marriage rate, upon divorce, or is it irrelevant? No, it's very much entwined, though it's, uh, the causality is not all in one direction. The president, when he spoke, for example, a couple of months ago about lack of mobility, growing inequality, and some of those numbers can be overplayed, said they were the reasons for the decline in marriage. It might have been one time you talked about marriage, and I don't want to be too terribly clear. The causality also goes in the opposite direction. Frankly, I focus on that. If you have great numbers of young people simply not graduating high school of all races, if you have great numbers of people committing crime of all races and having records and then having a hard time getting a job and building a, a career, you're not going to be, if you're talking about men now, you're not going to be terribly marriageable in the eyes of a lot of women. Hence family breakdown, fragmentation along those lines. It's, if you remember Harlan Cleveland, who was uh, the first dean of the Humphrey Institute, now the Humphrey School, I did some work with him. And he said, I shouldn't, we shouldn't think in terms of layer cakes when thinking about metaphors. It's a marble cake. And I would argue, if I wanted to be tad ideological here, that folks on the left 
focus on growing inequality to the extent it's growing and slowing mobility to the extent that it's slowing is the reason for main reason for family fragmentation and folks on the right have it reversed on that. If you have great numbers of young people simply not graduating high school of all races, if you have great numbers of people committing crime of all races and having records and then having a hard time getting a job and building a, a career, you're not going to be, if you're talking about men now, you're not going to be terribly marriageable in the eyes of a lot of women. Hence, family breakdown, fragmentation along those lines. It's, if you remember Harlan Cleveland, who was uh, the first dean of the Humphrey Institute, now in the Humphrey School, I did some work with him, and he said, I shouldn't, we shouldn't think in terms of layer cakes when thinking about metaphors. It's a marble cake. And I would argue, if I wanted to be tad ideological here, that folks on the left focus on growing inequality to the extent it's growing and slowing mobility to the extent that it's slowing is the reason for main reason for family fragmentation and folks on the right have it reversed. I, I do think that uh, that we have a serious you, you heard what I said uh, out of respect uh, in, in the way there of respect. There are a growing number of economists who are wondering whether capitalism as we know it um, is is delivering the goods. Um, uh, we've got chronic unemployment, underemployment, and declining wages uh, now for 30 years, for about 30 years. And, um, uh, and, and this surely has an impact on all everything, health, safety, um, violence, crime, people, more people desperate, uh, people not, not seeing a way out. Uh, certainly has an effect. Uh, other nations that have more economic security uh, and that have less equality do not have the social problems we have. And that's almost all of the industrialized democracies in the rest of the world, all of whom have larger governments, larger public sector, higher floors, uh, more security. Um, uh, everybody uh, in uh, Scandinavia, yay, um, and, and I'm a Texan. Um, uh, uh, it belongs to that society in a way that makes them productive. Uh, when I when I talk to my uh, in, my, my my wife is standing, so I'm assimilated. Um, she uh, we went to Sweden, and I talked to this guy. He was the equivalent of a conservative Republican in Sweden. He was a businessman. Complained a little bit about his taxes, um, but uh, he used this analogy. You know, he said there, there's this feeling that by some that if you kept a dog hungry and starving, that it would be a better hunting dog, be more effective. He said it's absolutely not true. He said that if you feed a dog well, it's well treated, well trained, feels secure, it will perform at a much higher level than a hungry dog. And I think that's a great, uh, a great analogy for uh, how a, a society ought to treat it. One of uh, my respondents in the book, a uh, great economist at Stanford, uh, Rick Hanischek, makes the point that at the very same time, uh, the United States is seeking to have more governmental involvement in the economy. Nations in Scandinavia are moving in the opposite direction. They're moving more to a free market. In fact, if it's all relative, and we have Norway with a lot of oil. Uh, <laughs> but this is where one of the points that needs to be made, to be real blunt, where questions of freedom come in. The United States is not Scandinavia. Our history is not that I would of, agree. of socialist, we'll never collectivist be nation. We'll, we'll never and be nor that. nor should we be. This is the great distinction of the United States, where, for all of our problems, you really can make it here. And the reason I am writing as I do, I recognize fully these economic pressures. So how do we contend? How do real life people contend with that? Well, you try to get a good education. Bill Raspberry uh, was out here, the former, the late, wonderful, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, a friend of Peter Bowers, I suspect, Washington Post. He was here about 20 years ago. And a uh, woman, Eileen, uh, knows this story, uh, that um, 
he was asked a modest question by a woman, uh, Mr. Raspberry, how do you fix poverty? And he said it was a good question. He'd been thinking about it a lot. And the best answer he had was that it's such a big problem, you can start any place. You can jump in any place and make a contribution. But for him, he would start with the boys. And that is precisely where I start because the line I used before. Boys become, at least I think I did, boys become men that women often don't want to marry and for very good reasons. So to give them an opportunity, a better education, not necessarily a more expensive one, to get a good job, have a career, to be married, to stay out of the pokey, that's what I write about. All right, we have time for one more question and I am going to call on former Congressman Martin Sable for that last uh, comment and or question. Part comment, part, part question. Uh, one observation on No Child Left Behind, the Minnesota delegation voted nine to one again. <laughs> and I think the uniform view that it was the overextension of the federal government in detail that they had no capacity to do when it comes to running. I suppose more fundamentally, what we have in this state, in this country, are 50 state elementary and secondary school systems. It is not a federal system, just as there's not a European system. There's a Norwegian system, a German system, an English system. Uh, and Mitch, I wonder, I at times like to be a little mischievous with people who came to lobby me. And quite often when ministers came to lobby me for expenditures of money, I said, if I delegate two problems to them, that if they could figure those out, which I think government has a very tough time dealing with, we'd have a lots of money. And that was in figuring out how to deal with end of life care and how to increase the marriage increase the number of people married in this country. And uh, I agree with you on, on its impact, but I'm not sure how in government we deal with it. Uh, and it, uh, to me, it is something that, uh, that, that other institutions uh, have to take the lead on. I absolutely agree. I very much appreciate the points you're making, the question you've asked. I do not, in trying to figure out how to uh, increase marriage rates, I'm talking about healthy, mutual regard marriages, I'm not talking about oppressive marriages or anything of the sort. Uh, I try and try, and lots of folks try and try. What can we do to improve marriage? And I assure you, I do not look to government first. The problem is there are so few levers. We're really talking about the culture in many ways. It's also economic. It's also tax policy, but at root, it's the very culture. What's in the air we breathe, what we think to be ultimately right, or responsible, and not. It's spiritual in many respects without getting too carried away. Governments are really not too good at that. I agree. Uh, all right. Oh, I could I just ask, Marty, who voted for NCLB? <laughs> Overstar. Pardon? Overstar. <laughs> Well, I know I have a lot of questions that would love to jump into um, some of this, and I'm sure a number of you have additional questions. And we're having a reception right outside out there after we adjourn in about two minutes here. And our speakers have been gracious enough to say they will stick around, and you can ask them some more questions then. Let me just uh, kind of wrap up things a little bit here, Joan, if I might. Uh, and I want to thank the League again for getting all of us together along with uh, the people at, at Augsburg who put a lot of work into this. We covered a lot of ground tonight. We had, I think, a thoughtful conversation. We talked about society and culture and economics and some history, uh, hunting dogs and other uh, things here. We listened to a, a very diverse views from the audience and from up here. We had what was really fun, I think, an intergenerational discussion.
at some of the questions, intercultural, and most important of all, I think we heard multiple sides of a lot of issues. And we have a better appreciation of the complexities of a lot of these things we're talking about. Of how do we build a better society, or in the words of our Constitution, how do we build a more perfect union? And the Sabo Center here hopes that all of you, uh, league members and, and uh, on the way home, will continue this conversation. I hope that this conversation will find its way back into some of the dorm rooms in Augsburg College of the students as time goes on. And in, in the think tanks, not only in Minnesota, but with your colleagues around the country. Because it is vitally important, as we heard at the very beginning, to the future of our democracy as we go forward in this complex and very di uh, diverse world to try to figure these things out. So let's, let's first of all give a big thank you to our two speakers for coming. Thank One of, the things, one of the things that the League always says is that people should take action. And as we leave tonight, let us all think of ways that we can take action. Um, it's, it's not that hard to call up a, an elected official and tell them how you feel, because they want to know how you feel, and you have a right and an obligation to do that. So if you have an issue that you're passionate about, take the time, make a call, send an email, uh, join with your friends to... To, to try to make the change that you want to see in our society, because I think what we've done tonight is we've all sat here and said, things are really bad. Well, that's only the first step, folks. The next step is what am I, as an individual, going to do to make things better? So think about it. You don't have to think about anything really groundbreaking or wonderful or big. It can be a very small thing, but many, many small things make some very big things happen. So. As you go out of here tonight, think about it or talk about it with your friends. What can you do to make it better? Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Doctor.